nurses are being brought to litigation right now. And if I can't get support in my unit from my peers, why would I want to stay? You know, why would I ever want to stay in that environment? So this is definitely one thing, in my opinion, that needs to be fixed because it's the definition of insanity to continue to bring new nurses into incivil or um, not civilized or unfriendly, unwelcoming, hostile environments. What does the nurses feed their young movement and how can we radically improve nursing culture? Let's talk all about it with nursing leader and consultant Teresa Sanderson right here on episode 408 of The Nurse Keith Show. Hey there, this is Nurse Keith. This podcast is always about you and your personal professional development, your nursing and healthcare career, and the healthcare system in the big picture. And I'm here to share education, ideas, diatribes, and informative interviews with some of the most inspiring people from the worlds of healthcare, nursing, entrepreneurship, and beyond. I love having you along for this ride. And I thank you from the bottom of my nurse podcaster's heart for being part of the growing Nurse Keith Nation. And guess what? You can now get CEUs from listening to podcasts. That's right. Over at rnegade.pro. That's rn E-G-A-D-E dot pro. They're building a library of nursing podcasts offering continuing education credits. Head over to rnegade.pro, log into the portal. You can select me or any other content creator from the dropdown and get CEUs for listening because if you're listening anyway, you might as well take a post test and get some credit. And if you'd like to help other people find the show, you can leave a rating and review over on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon, or Spotify. And you can head to nursekeith.com to the show notes for this episode, or you can always find the show notes in whatever podcasting app where you happen to be listening. Like I said, we are here today with Teresa Sanderson. She's a nursing leader, well-known consultant, and the founder of the Nurses Feed Their Young movement. And Teresa, it's great to have you here. And the very first thing I want to ask you is, what is the Nurses Feed Their Young movement all about? Oh, gosh. Well, thank you, first of all, for having me. It's truly an honor and a blessing to be here. But the Nurses Feed Their Young movement is a movement that um, I have started earlier or in 2022 to really stop the bleeding or the max S mass exodus that's happening among nursing personnel um, in the United States because of poor working environments and negative nursing cultures. So really the movement, uh, Nurses Feed Their Young, our mission is to infuse emotional intelligence into the everyday skill set of nurses and nursing leaders so that we can improve nursing retention, decrease stress and burnout, and improve the patient experience. Okay. And Right now, when you and I are recording, which is January 11th, 2023, there are nurses on strike in New York State in a variety of settings. And we can understand it's not necessarily a great public relations issue because, you know, patients can suffer in the short term, but nurses are looking, they have the long view right? They're looking back and they're looking at the present and they're trying to look at what the future can hold. And like you said on your website, 38% of nurses were planning to leave the bedside in 2022. I don't know exactly how those numbers panned out in reality, but I think they, it, that's a pretty big statement of where nurses are at. So there's negative culture. There's also work-life balance issues, nurses not feeling appreciated by their employers, Um, there's pay issues, but then also staffing and people feel burned out. They feel like they can't provide the type of care they want. So do you feel like we're just sort of in the same place we've always been, even though we had this whole like heroes work here movement during the pandemic and everything, have we made any strides or are things basically like, are we marking time? That is, that is a great question. And in my opinion, I talk with 
so many nurses every single week. And I really feel like if anything, we are just barely keeping our heads above water. I don't see that we have made necessary changes to improve the working conditions for nurses, the things that have caused us stress and burnout for the 32 years that I've been a nurse. Um, When I became a nurse back in the early 90s, we were already talking about nursing shortage and struggling with staffing issues. And those problems have continued up until today. You know, what I think has happened in the last couple of years specifically is that the global pandemic brought all of the problems that nursing has had for such a long time up to the surface so that the entire public could now see it. And I think that's really, you know, what has happened. So it's really just kind of brought it to to the forefront so that everybody can see it and recognize, oh my goodness, I had no idea. You know, nurses were struggling with this, that, and the other, but now it seems everybody knows. And, you know, so I think while we may not have had those changes yet that are going to impact work environment, culture, life balance, all those things, I believe now that with the awareness that we have on the topic or on all of these topics, change is hopefully going to be forced to come. Mm -hmm. And like I said, during the pandemic, you know, you drive by a hospital and there'd be, you know, a hero's work here banner. And we would see people like even in neighborhoods here in Santa Fe at 7 PM, they'd be out banging pots and pans, even though none of them really understood that no nurse gets out at seven. So they wouldn't hear the pots and pans being banged anyway, but still the, it was thoughtful. I mean, it was a nice gesture on the part of citizens. My fear during the pandemic was that you know, with all this talk of heroes and heroism, which I always feel like is kind of dehumanizing in a way. And I I always like the term warrior instead of hero, because <laughs> that's what it feels like, you know. It doesn't feel like the gains we made in terms of appreciation and acknowledgement of nurses' contributions during the, the height of the pandemic have really resulted in any changes on the ground. And I think the New York State situation that's occurring right now as we record this Mm -hmm. is is symptomatic of the fact that we're kind of in that same place again. So what do you think are some of the potential solutions that we need to look at? Ooh, and this, you know, it's a loaded question, isn't it? Because I think there are so many layers. It, it's like peeling an onion when we start looking at how did nursing get here to this point? Um, there are so many layers, whether they be healthcare administration or finance and budgeting. And then, and then there are the interpersonal relationships among nurses and how we treat each other and um, nursing leadership who many times lack training or have not had appropriate training to even enter their roles. There are so many, so many layers to this that um, it's it's hard to say, you know, well, it would, I don't think we'd be able to say there's any one thing that's going to solve it all, right? I think there's going to be multiple things that need to happen to be able to solve the problem. Some of those things are going to be um, finding a way to number one, value nurses. Um, I would love to see nurses have um, be able to have more balance in their lives and know that when you have a day off, it's not just something theoretical on paper or hypothetical. You may be off on Saturday and we're not going to call you um, because all of those things lead to stress and burnout, never really feeling like you have that downtime. So I think leadership really needs, leadership in healthcare really needs to take a hard look at How is the income coming in to the facilities that employ nurses? How is the income coming in? Who's responsible for the care? Who's responsible for for, um, those patient satisfaction reviews and surveys and getting positive results on those? And then finding a way, finding a way, looking for a way and finding a way to reward nurses appropriately financially. Um, That's going to be a piece of it. And also, Better treatment would just go a long way, you know, feeling appreciated, feeling, you know, again, simple things, life balance, having a day off, 
mm-hmm. you know, finding a way to make those things happen. I mean, we've been at this for a long time in this country as, with healthcare as an industry. It's time that we, <laughs> time that we really brought the profession of nursing up and elevated it as a profession. And I think not only nurses need to do that, but people who employ nurses mm-hmm. um, need to do that as well. Yeah. And you, like I said at the top, and I asked you that first question is about the nurses feed their young movement. Mm-hmm. And um, it's funny, it's NFTY. Do you call it nifty? I do. <laughs> <You too. Okay. laughs> so regarding nifty, nurses feed their young. Mm-hmm. Um, and when we say young, we don't necessarily mean just young by age. We mean novices, like novice mm-hmm. nurses, you know, mm-hmm. young in the profession. And of course, the preponderance of those will be younger people, but not always. Mm-hmm. I know a nurse who just graduated and he's 60, just became a nurse. So that does happen. Mm-hmm. So what is it about what happens when someone enters the profession and has their first job and they're in that first, that really volatile first year or two where Mm -hmm. it can kind of make or break your career because of how you're treated and what your experience is. Mm -hmm. What is it we need to know about that initial period that informs whether we see attrition or we see retention of those new fresh-faced graduates who are just launching their careers? Yes, I love that question. And speaking of, you know, when we think of nurses feed their young, I see this happening not only with um, new novice nurses, right, and younger nurses, but also it can be, this can even be a nurse who's maybe a seasoned nurse and who's being called to float to another unit may experience the nurses eat their young phenomenon, you know, that just um, you don't know everything, you know, so the eye rolling begins. And I think what happens when a new nurse comes into any situation, whether young or old, um, typically in most work environments, there is, um, there's usually a a mindset of the nurses who are already there. They're seasoned on that unit. They've been working there for some time. I don't have time to answer your questions. Um, I've asked questions as a new nurse on a unit, and I've heard this from so many other nurses. When I asked a question, where do I find this or how do I do that? I met with eye rolling or a heavy sigh or even told, nobody showed me how to do that. Why should I show you? So over the course of, and I, like I said, I've been a nurse for 32 years. So I experienced nurses eating their young before I even graduated nursing school was my first experience with that type of uh, situation. But I think what's happened over decades of this kind of kind of hostile interaction, this incivility among nurses, not being able to welcome a new nurse who, in my opinion, is like a diamond in the rough, right? Ready to be polished. We need to covet those resources of new nurses, but typically that doesn't happen and they get treated very poorly. And so over all the decades that this has happened, I personally feel that nurses have developed almost a generational type of dysfunction in our relationships because when a new nurse comes on, and is trained and mentored or precepted in this way, that nurse then is going to precept or mentor or welcome a new nurse the same way. Mm -hmm. And so we begin to hand this behavior down from one nurse to another to another. And um, I think it's, it's truly just a shame because at the same time, we're struggling with staffing New nurses are coming in, they get treated this way, and then we end up with the attrition. Why would they stay Mm -hmm. in an unwelcoming, unfriendly environment? Let's face it, nurses are being brought to litigation right now. And if I can't get support in my unit from my peers, why would I want to stay? You know, why would I ever want to stay in that environment? So I think it's, um, this is definitely one thing, in my opinion, that needs to be fixed because it's the definition of insanity Mm -hmm. to continue to bring new nurses into incivil or um, not civilized or unfriendly, unwelcoming, hostile environments. Right. And on your website, it says, 
quote, recruiting new nurses to work in the same old work environment and negative culture is a recipe for disaster. Expecting current staff to remain in this space is setting the stage for failure. And you lay out on your website this three-pronged approach, Mm -hmm. improving culture, strengthening retention, and recruitment. So we just talked very briefly about improving culture, you know, and there's plenty of people doing this work. There's you, there's Dr. Renee Thompson in the Healthy Workforce Institute that she founded Mm -hmm. some years ago. There's plenty of people out there doing this work. And I think there's plenty of work to go around (laughs) because obviously, I mean, how many hospitals and healthcare systems are there in the United States? Yes. So there's plenty of room for people like you and Dr. Thompson and others to get out there and, you know, carry the banner of these types of changes. But what do we need to know from the nurses other than we eat our young and there's the eye rolling and the incivility? What else is going on? in that culture that you've identified that you feel like are these, you know, systemic issues within, Mm -hmm. within the organ, within the profession and Mm -hmm. organizations. One of the things that I believe is sorely lacking. Okay. um, Would be the lack of training, leadership training that nursing leaders actually have. You know, now more than ever, I believe it's very common for nurses to be be working on a unit, have six months experience, and all of a sudden they're the senior nurse on that unit and a new manager is needed. So, hey, it's you. It's your turn. <laughs> and we're going to put you in this role. We're not going to give you any training for it. But all of a sudden you're leading a team of, you know, 10, 15, 20 other nurses and a staff on your unit and you've got to manage your budget and you've got to know how to treat your people. And typically, nurses, we don't know how to do that. We know mm-hmm. how to do the work at the bedside. Mm-hmm. We're not necessarily great at communicating with other nursing personnel about how can I help you do your job better? What do you need today? Um, not to mention somebody who's not trained as a leader who's put in a leadership position is going to feel overwhelmed. They're not going to have solutions. They're probably going to have things to do on their desk, on their task list that they've not been trained to do, but have a deadline to meet. So I think that is a very, that's a very tragic thing that's happening is that we have people in leadership who've never been trained to lead. Um, Add to that, they don't have the communication skills or emotional intelligence skills to be able to come to the table and understand the person standing in front of them Mm -hmm. and to show up in the best possible way to communicate effectively with other people. So I think leadership is a, is a big, big problem. Lack of training in leadership. The other thing is um, I believe that nurses need to be trained in um, communication strategies. I believe we need to be trained in self-care before we ever come out of our curriculum. That would be my dream is that nurses have those skills formally trained in their basic nursing curriculum because Keith probably you and I both know that when a patient complains on the unit a patient and family becomes what we call difficult typically the only person who can solve that problem is the poor nurse manager you know we end up in that situation and so so often our nursing leaders are tied up putting out fires and they can't work on the business of leading so there are a lot of things that I believe are problematic here, but I think the basic skill set of being prepared to know and understand how to take care of ourselves as human beings, as well as nurses, um, and being able to communicate and understand each other well, I think those things are paramount and also some leadership development. Mm. Yeah, leadership development. When we come back from the break, I want to dig a little bit more into that particular aspect. I also want to talk about emotional intelligence, which you're speaking my language when you talk about that. And you mention it very clearly on your website and in your literature. Mm 
And I want to talk a little bit about your history as well. So hang in there with us and we'll be back for the second half of episode 408 of the Nurse Case Show with Teresa Sanderson, the founder of Nurses Feed Their Young. Hey everyone, let's take a quick pause for the cause, shall we? Thanks for being a valued listener of the Nurse Keith Show. And if you'd like to help other people find the podcast, please consider leaving a rating and review over on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. This really helps propel the show and grow our audience. And I truly appreciate everyone who's already taken the time. And if leaving a public rating review isn't your thing, why not tell a colleague about the Nurse Keith Show by sending them a link so they can listen for themselves? After all, word of mouth is the most organic way for me to reach those who truly need to tune in. So if you'd like to do me a solid, please consider leaving a rating review or telling a friend or colleague. And by doing so, you'll be helping the Nurse Keith Show reach more and more nurses and healthcare professionals all around the world. Now, let's get back to today's conversation. And welcome back to the second half of the episode. We're here again on episode 408 with friend of the pod and my new friend and colleague, Teresa Sanderson, the founder of Nurses Feed Their Young, also known as Nifty. And (laughs) Teresa, prior to the break, we were talking about leadership and training. So one of the differences, I believe, that's been reported and kind of um, just talked about in terms of the difference between an ADN education and a bachelor's level nursing education is that bachelor's level nurses are trained in leadership and management. In my experience, in my own program, I think we had one one semester course on leadership and management, I'm pretty sure. Um, and some, you know, assigned reading and stuff like that. Do you feel that what's being offered in terms of leadership training at, let's say, the bachelor's level is adequate in terms of what they're facing when they get out of school and they're actually there on the ground doing the work? I would have to say no. I don't feel it's adequate. And the reason I say that is because I talk with nurses every day who are mm-hmm. masters prepared, doctorate prepared, who say they were never <laughs> they were never prepared um, for nursing leadership in the based on real world nursing, right? I I think there's a lot of things that we can learn from books, but they don't necessarily equate to what's happening on the unit and what are the dynamics that happen real life day to day in nursing. And so many things are like that in nursing anyway. Um, But I think I would have to say, yeah, I think that that definitely needs to be something that is looked at and improved upon and um, that curriculum added to for sure. And like I've talked about on this show, ad nauseum, ad infinitum, Mm -hmm. is that when something isn't really truly covered in any robust fashion on the NCLEX, and of course we have to go back to the NCLEX, unfortunately, it doesn't get covered in academic settings in nursing education because they need to spend their time teaching to the NCLEX because passing rates of the NCLEX affects so many things when it comes to the school's accreditation, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we come back to that ages old issue of they're just going to teach to the test because that's what they have time to do. And when they're pressed and there's shortage of faculty, which I recognize is an ongoing issue too, no fault of theirs, then we're caught in this vicious cycle where there isn't time to teach leadership skills and emotional intelligence, et cetera. And you mentioned one of your dreams. One of my dreams is that every single nursing graduate, ADN or BSN, enters a new nurse 
residency program for one year where they get mm -hmm. intensive training. I don't mean just like a couple courses here and there. I mean, an intensive new nurse residency. And it's not this precious thing that only a few people get in because of the competitive nature of getting into those programs. You know, we need time where we actually are set up as a, as a, um, uh, basically student charge nurse or new nurse resident charge nurse, where you work alongside the person who is the charge nurse and you observe and they watch you because face it, when you need to learn a skill like, I don't know, central line care or vena puncture or catheterization, they don't just have you read about it in a book and then say, go do it. Mm -hmm. You actually watch it a several times. You practice on a on a mannequin, whether high fidelity or not, and then you do it, and you're being watched carefully by your preceptor a bunch of times until you get signed off, and then you fly on your own and you do that catheterization or that vena puncture, or starting the IV or hanging blood or chemotherapy. Why do we expect? nurses to be able to lead and have the emotional and relational intelligence to lead when, like you said, you can't just learn it from books. So doesn't that figure into this where they're just not getting the opportunity to practice those, what we could call them soft skills, but they're, <laughs> they're soft skills that are hard to learn. <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree with that. I totally agree. And I think that is that is how we learn. You know, I'm I'm at the point in my career now that I'm very comfortable with uncomfortable conversations, you know, but you don't get there overnight. You do that by, like you said, practicing and learning. And I didn't have anybody really who trained me or oversaw that, but it was just something that I learned to manage intuitively because I was one of those nurses. I've been a nurse 32 years and probably 27 of those years I spent in leadership. Mm -hmm. So I was often the next one in line and got bumped up to leadership. And for some reason, I took it upon myself to learn how to do certain things. And one of those was being a good communicator or, or a better communicator. I still aspire to be better. But I think when when we don't have the benefit of, you know, having someone there with us the first time we need to do something, whether it's have a, dis, you know, maybe a disciplinary conversation with someone or um, how do we, how do we train a new employee? Let somebody, let's have somebody precept the preceptor on how do we appropriately bring on a new employee? I want to watch you mentor this new person and see how you do that. Because it shouldn't just be the senior nurse on the unit who's able to do that if that nurse has the negative attitude. So we need to be looking at who's doing what and being sure they're equipped to get the job done. So we need mentoring and precepting of the preceptors. They need to be precepting and mentoring the new ones. The new mm -hmm. ones need to be learning how to mentor and precept and yes. so on and on it goes. Mm -hmm. So you talk about in your literature and on your website about the bank methodology, B-A-N-K, and this is something you feel can really significantly improve nursing culture and work environments. What is the bank methodology? Thank you for asking. The bank methodology, um, it's a scientifically validated um, personality assessment system that allows you to determine based on a value set, okay, traits and characteristics of the person in front of you. So the bank methodology, it has, it was developed by Sherry Tree, um, first of all, and it was initially created as a, as a tool for salespeople to improve um, the closure of sales. And the interesting thing about that was, is, is that as the bank methodology spread and people began using it, the reports came back, yes, my income has increased, but you know what? My marriage is better. 
I had a friend who was using this and they didn't commit suicide. They were contemplating suicide. Um, my relationship with my children is better. So as people started using this tool, they found, wow, there are some significant things that can happen when we understand the personality set of the person in front of, or the value set of the person in front of us. So um, there are four personal, primary personality types. And one important thing to know, Keith, is that each of us has all four of those personality types within us. So it's kind of like blood pressure or heart rate changes from second to second. We kind of go in and out of them. My own personality is BNKA using the letters of bank. The B is for blueprint and a person who has a blueprint personality, I'll just give you a quick overview of these, values things like stability, structure, structure, predictability, step-by-step um, instructions, things like that, rules, tradition. Um, the action personality, that's the A in bank, think red carpet um, action. This person wants to get to the bottom line. They, they're the person in the staff meeting that says, I don't need to be here for an hour. Give me the bullet points and let me go. You know, that they want the bottom line and just get them in and get them out. The nurturing personality, that's the N in the bank system. Nurturers are um, warm like the sun. These are your huggers. They, they value authenticity, relationships, and things like that. And when you're thinking patient satisfaction, if patients are complaining on a unit that they feel like a number, the nurturing personality type might be something you would think about increasing in the personnel who are working on that unit, hmm. okay? Because they're the ones who will spend the extra time at the bedside talking, smiling, hand-holding, those kinds of things. And the K in the bank methodology is the knowledge personality type. And the knowledge personality values um, universal truths, science, data. So when I think of nurses, I think research, clinical trials, um, studies, things like that. They're probably going to excel in those environments. So the bank system, though, if you can imagine what I just told you on four little cards, a blue one, a red one, a yellow one, and a green one with basic values on each, literally a nursing leader could put those four cards on a desk and ask a new applicant or a nurse who's already on staff, read these cards sort them for me in the order of importance for you from highest to lowest. And in 90 seconds, we would understand the core values of that person and how we can best communicate with them to bring out the best in them. Mm. Yeah, it's. I'm looking at Sherry Tree's website. It's C-H-E-R-I, mm -hmm. Tree, mm -hmm. Sherry Tree. Mm -hmm. And I that brings to mind work I've done with others on the DISC assessment, DISC, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. fairly similar. You've mm -hmm. got data oriented people, you've got the nurturing, more right brained people. And mm -hmm. good communication means if you're addressing a data driven person, you're not going to bring to them your right brained, like, feelings and yes. you know intuitions because they're not mm -hmm. going to connect with the, with what you're saying you need to speak others language and you need to yes. be able to meet them where they are and mm -hmm. that comes down to one of my pet concepts what's mm -hmm. more than a concept is emotional intelligence which mm -hmm. i've always understood that to mean it's your ability to to acknowledge, read, label, and respond to your own feelings, mm -hmm. and then to be able to do the same for those around you. And then that bleeds sort of into relational and behavioral intelligence. Yes. So do we teach emotional intelligence in nursing school? Do we teach it to our, our future clinicians? No. We do not. No. We do not. And I think the interesting thing is, and I wrote, I wrote a paper on this the other day, because I really believe that things like the bank methodology and emotional intelligence, these are innovations in our age-old therapeutic communication. Therapeutic communication hasn't had any major changes to it. You know, since I became a nurse and went through nursing school, we, you know, we clarify, we, you know, we reflect, we mm -hmm. do these things, but it's mm -hmm. never with the idea of what is the value set of the person in front of me 
what how do they best understand it's never it's never with that it's it's the same type of questions and the same simple strategy whereas now using a tool like bank we can gather a lot more information and respond in a way that that person is going to feel heard they're going to be validated and they're going to be able to listen to us talk about growing that no like and trust factor that is so necessary when we can show that angry i always think about the angry daughter in a patient's room and i've probably been that angry daughter before <laughs> but yeah. i think about that person who is so hard to console and who's saying i was told this test was going to happen at eight o'clock this morning i haven't seen anybody my dad hasn't eaten since last night he's been npo you know all of these things coming out of this person and typically what happens is the nurse will come out and say that daughter in room 103 you know, I can't stand to go in there. That's a difficult family. Yeah, she is unhinged or whatever. Exactly. Right? And and all of a sudden, when they get labeled difficult, they lose access mm -hmm. to, yeah. you know, the best nursing care. They lose access to the yeah. team because nobody wants to go in there, right, and confront that. Yeah. And then nobody at end of shift at report, that nurse is going to say, you know, that daughter in 107, mm -hmm. watch out. Exactly. Right? So that nurse exactly. goes in with their defenses up. and Right. Whereas if we listened, if we listened to that, that person saying this was supposed to happen at 8 a.m., it hasn't happened yet. That is a blueprint personality mm. crying out to be heard. I'm I need this step by step. I was mm. told this was going to happen at this time. And if we could just come to the table, you know, and say, I recognize that didn't happen right at that time. And I know yeah. you're very upset about that, you yeah. know. Let's take some time to let me find out what I can find out about when that's going to happen so that you know and understand what's mm -hmm. going to happen. So so you've been a nurse for three decades, um, a little bit more than me. I'm I'm on just about 27 years. Okay. So we're we're in that same ballpark. And you see yourself as a servant leader. You founded the nurses eat their nurses eat their young nurses feed their young nifty mm -hmm. movement and you train healthcare organizations and nursing leaders and nurses and you focus on emotional intelligence this notion of values based hiring where we try to assess a potential candidate's values like where are they coming from what mm -hmm. what drives them and motivates them and recruitment and retention so all of those things you work with organizations you also work with nurse entrepreneurs to help mm -hmm. them succeed so you do all these different things so you've been around the block you're not talking from some theoretical place where you've read it in books you've you've been a nurse with boots on the ground a long time yes so when it comes down to it if we have these large percentage of nurses saying they want to leave the bedside or even leave the profession and then we have all these nurses who are experiencing burnout and the new nurses who feel like they're not getting what they need. And we have academia where things aren't getting addressed that need to be addressed because it's not on the exam. Mm -hmm. um, so where would you want to see us in, let's say, 2040, 17 years from now? What's changed? Mm. What's wow. if you were if you could just kind of call it? What mm -hmm. would you what would you be seeing? One of the things I'm going to start this by saying one of the things that I am working toward and researching right now is how to establish a national certification for nurses that is based on emotional intelligence and communication, because I believe this is this is one of the key things that we need to address um, to finally create a positive nursing culture and positive work environments. I think this is this is key. This is one this is one piece of the puzzle and it's my piece of the puzzle. So this is what I focus on in my lifetime, right? In 2040, I believe that certification is active mm -hmm. and and I see that hospitals and facilities value that certification so much that they employ at least one nurse with that certification on every single unit. And that nurse is the champion of culture and work environment. 
on mm. every I see them as coveted resources. A culture all champion. The mm -hmm. I like that. Okay. Yep. So a national certification mm -hmm. where this becomes really like the, one of the gold standards. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. And mm -hmm. what would be some of the outcomes of having that? What would we actually see, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in action? I think in action, it'll, it'll boil down to a couple of simple things. Um, this strategy that I have with nurses feed their young is really about nurses doing some work intrinsically or internally and improving how they relate to the external environment, right? So I believe when a nurse is trained in emotional intelligence and in the bank methodology and these kinds of things, their stress levels and burnout levels will naturally decrease because they don't experience it the same way. I can understand now that someone coming to me with some negative posturing or um, negative comments, I can understand where that's coming from and I don't take it as personal anymore. And, and better than that, I know how to respond. Hmm. So I really see that work environments will improve. I see that nursing leaders will have valuable tools and they will not only be able to employ nurses, they'll be able to put the right nurse in the right role based on that nurse's intrinsic values and innate skills. Whereas right now we do what I call hire and hope. And I think when we when we can integrate these kinds of things into nursing practice, we're gonna improve culture, we're going to improve nursing environment, we will improve recruitment and retention and solve so many of our problems. And the basic satisfaction of each nurse with their role in healthcare. That's a really nice vision. I really like that. So. <laughs> We look at the emotional intelligence. We look at all this values-based hiring. We look at this concept on your website of having stay interviews. We don't have just exit interviews where we exit, we interview like, why are you leaving? We right. actually interview them and say, why are you staying? What makes exactly. you stay? And I really like that. I've never seen that before. And I, I noted that from your website. I thought, wow, that's super cool. So mm -hmm. stay interviews. Mm -hmm. And you know, imagine if we did that and we got that feedback, that would be really wonderful. So what a concept, <laughs> what a concept. So when organizations work with you, you go in and you, you help teach the bank methodology and some of these other strategies. I do. Mm -hmm. I do. And, um, it's, it's a wonderful thing to be able to do. And, um, the training is offered a few different ways. I do live mm -hmm. trainings. I also do virtual trainings. Um, and I do, you know, just whatever's, whatever's necessary, you know, to try and get the word out right now. Yeah. And if people want to learn about it or pass the information on to, to folks at their healthcare organization, they can go to TeresaSanderson.com and it's Teresa T-E-R-E-S-A without the H Sanderson, which is easy.com. You're also on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. Those links will all be in the show notes at my website and also on whatever app where people happen to be listening. Mm -hmm. So TeresaSanderson.com. And Teresa, before we close, I have four lightning round questions I ask all my guests. Are you game for a quick lightning round? Sure. Okay. <laughs> so the first question is, how do you define success, either personally and or professionally? Oh, success to me is um, being content with what I have in every moment. Hmm. Wow. That's simple and concise and really <laughs> nice way to look at one's life. Okay. Second, could you name or just describe a person who's inspired you in the course of your life? It could be, they can be living or dead. They could be very famous, or they could be someone who none of us would ever have heard of before. I think that would, that would be my mother. Mm -hmm. Um, my mother um, had an infantile stroke when she was two years old, and this was back, you know, in the late 30s, right? So they thought what she had was polio. We only found out when she was in her 50s and had a brain scan that it was an infantile stroke that she had had. She had to relearn how to walk. But as a result, she had partial paralysis on the right side. My mom can play baseball. She raised three children. She played basketball. And when we were growing up, she never let us say the word can't. And um, I just um, have always admired her as an inspiration. Oh, is she still 
alive? She is. She has um, mid-stage Alzheimer's right now. Mm -hmm. Um, So we're working through that, but she's still with us. Oh, well, bless her heart. Yeah. (laughs) Same generation as my mom. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. So third, the penultimate question, is there a book or a movie? It doesn't have to be your absolute favorite because that's often hard for us to name an absolute favorite that's had an impact on the way you think or the way you live your life. That book for me would be The Compound Effect by Darren Hardy um, that talks about all the simple, seemingly inconsequential things that we do every day that um, allow us to progress toward our habits for good or bad. So it's, uh, but really if, you know, one good action taken today, followed by another tomorrow, followed by another the next day, you're going to gain compound interest on that. So it can be a very positive thing. Hmm. Yeah. It's the compound effect, multiply your success one simple step at a time. Jumpstart Mm -hmm. your income, life, and success by Darren Hardy. Cool. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. (laughs) Okay. And finally, last question, which is a new one. I just changed it with episode 407. Oh, man. If you were elected queen of the world, and in my world, there would be an election, actually. Mm-hmm. What's one of the first things you would want to do to improve the lives of your subjects? And this would mean you had ultimate power. You could do whatever you wanted to make people's lives better. What would you do? Wow. I would just make sure that everybody had enough to eat and a roof over their head and that there were no barriers to that for anybody. Mm. Food, clothing, and shelter. Mm -hmm. So you would start with Maslow's hierarchy. You'd start at the bottom and work your way up. I would. That's a smart sovereign. (laughs) That's a smart sovereign. Thank you. Thank you, my queen. That's a good one. Well, Teresa, thank you so much. This has been so lovely. You're brilliant. And I think nurses feed their young. Nifty is a great idea great movement and i hope it's wildly successful and we'll um we'll sit down and talk about all the successes in 2040 or probably before that (laughs) sounds great thank you so much well there you have it thanks for listening to this awesome episode of the nurse keith show with Teresa sanderson of teresasanderson.com and nurses feed their young the show notes will be at nursekeith.com or on any app where you happen to be listening if you need personalized holistic career coaching look no further than nursekeith.com mention the show and get 10 percent off your first coaching package become a patron at patreon.com forward slash nurse keith if you'd like to support the show in that way and remember that you can earn CEUs for listening to podcasts at rnegade.pro, R-N-E-G-A-D-E.pro. Log into the portal, select me or any other content creator, get your CEUs because you know what? You're listening anyway. So why not earn those credits as you go? We are proud members of the Health Podcast Network at healthpodcastnetwork.com. We're produced adroitly, and lovingly by Rob Johnston of 520R Podcasting. And Mark Cappy Spiesen is our wonderful and stalwart social media ringmaster and newsletter wrangler. Before we say goodbye, I'll leave you with this quote by poet and writer David White. One of the keys to any possible happiness in work must be the little self-knowledge it takes to know what we desire in life, how we are made, and how we belong to the rest of the world. Be well, dig deep, seek joy, keep in touch. This is Nurse Keith saying adios till next time from beautiful and incredibly windy Santa Fe, New Mexico, and the inimitable Teresa Sanderson saying arrivederci from Robinson, Kansas. Thank you so much, Teresa. Thank you to everyone for listening, and we'll catch you on the very proverbial flip side. Flip side.